Good afternoon, everybody. I, I've been incredibly fortunate to have Steve Brown as my pal and collaborator for Gulp th 35 years. We first met at the University of Minnesota in 1979 when I was five and he was 11. <laughs> but I could tell immediately he was a gifted child. Actually, Steve and I had just joined the psychology department at the U, and I was a newly minted staff member at the counseling center in those days. We quickly discovered that we had a lot, a lot in common, not the least of which was a passion for ideas, a fondness for happy hours, and a tendency to lose track of our cars and parking garages. In case you're wondering, there was no connection, no causal relationship <laughs> between those two events. But we did tend to do our best work in those days, and probably still, on the backs of cocktail napkins. In fact, a wet bottle of beer on the wrong cocktail napkin was responsible for delaying the conception of the first handbook of counseling psychology by several months. <laughs> Well, as president of the Steve, Brand fa Steve Brown Fan Club, I can't claim to be unbiased. But I will try to convey, briefly, a small part of what I think would make Leona Tyler smile at the thought of Steve Brown receiving the award named in her honor. Steve has an uncanny ability to look at the same phenomena that have puzzled other researchers or to find areas where prior research has hit a dead end, and to somehow come up with a creative new perspective leading to a, a revival of research activity and to the rapid acquisition of new knowledge. Just a few examples of where he's done this include his seminal meta-analyses of career choice counseling and his recent work on the conceptualization of problems in vocational decision making. Much of his breakthrough work has come with current or former students. The range of Steve's scholarship has been remarkable, and I couldn't do justice to it in a brief inter introduction. But adding to his subject matter expertise, Steve's methodological, statistical, and theoretical skills have made him a Renaissance scholar in our field. Steve's vision for pushing our knowledge envelope and for crossing the boundaries uh, of psychological specialties resulted in the creation of the first handbook of counseling psychology in 1984 with three more editions over the next quarter century. Let me comment on another equally compelling but probably less obvious dimension of Steve's qualifications for the Tyler Award. He's been remarkably generative as a mentor, and generous too. Steve's former advisees include some of the most productive researchers in our field today. A number of them are, or will be, Division Fellows, and they've served Division 17 in numerous capacities, for instance, as Chair of the Society for Vocational Psychology and as an Associate Editor of JCP. But Steve hasn't, hasn't simply been lucky with his advisees. He provides an enriched mentoring environment that brings out the best in students and that inspires so many of them to test their own intellectual wings. Now, I don't want to leave you with the impression that Steve is a saint. <laughs> he can be provocative at times. He can, he's no fan of groupthink. And his intellectual honesty can be bracing. Those of you of a certain age might think of the character of Lou Grant on the old Mary Tyler Moore show. <laughs> I can tell there aren't that many people of a certain age. <laughs> Blue Steve laughed. You know. <laughs> the topic of Steve's talk today is a good example. You might look at the title and ask, has Steve turned into an old curmudgeon? <laughs> well, such an assumption would be totally wrong. Let me assure you that he was once a young curmudgeon. <laughs> but we need, we need curmudgeons. Let me rephrase that. We need those who are courageous enough to invite us to question our business as usual and to keep us connected to our field's earliest strengths and values. That's not reactionary. 
that can be revisionary. The Society of Counseling Psychology has a very rare gem in Steve Brown. He made a giant imprint on the scholarship of our field, and he's been a one-person faculty production line. Steve has been one of our brightest stars for decades, and I'm delighted and greatly honored to be his friend and to introduce him today. I know that receiving the Tyler Award is incredibly meaningful to Steve. Please join me in welcoming and congratulating him. On top of that, you're getting uh, CE credits. <laughs> so I think I have to come up with something profound to say. Um, I'll try. I'll try. Um, before I start, I have a confession. I've given parts of this talk uh, in different venues uh, in the past few years at SVP in Boston, SV at NCDA in Boston, and at Padova in Italy. This is the first time I've kind of put it all together into one talk, but if any of you were at any of those talks or all those talks, you're, I, you won't hurt my feelings if you want to leave, okay? <laughs> Before I start, though, there are some people I do need to thank. One, of course, is the Society for Vocational for Counseling Psychology for honoring me with the Leona Tyler Award. Bob for his most gracious introduction and all of you for attending. In addition, I, uh, in addition, Ed Titus, Bud Taylor, David Skeen, and Dominic Costanzo, psychology faculty at Muskingum College, convinced a dumb jock, <laughs> convinced a dumb jock that he might actually be able to use his head for something other than a battering ram. My first major sources of academic self-efficacy. Lloyd Lofquist, Renee Dallas at the University of Minnesota, who, who made my um, initial academic appointment an amazing learning experience. Uh, I wouldn't be here without them. Uh, Ellen Betts for the occupational socialization and support she gave a neophyte faculty member, and Jim Rounds for sharing bottles of scotch and closing bars with me. <laughs> My current colleagues at Loyola University Chicago and past colleagues, Liz Vera and Ju Yoon, Suzette Spite, and Anita Thomas, I couldn't have been at Loyola for as long as I have without such remarkable colleagues. My students, past and present, who've influenced my thinking in just immeasurable ways, uh, although being good students, they think everything has to be measured. <laughs> and then there's Bob. What do you say about Bob? <clears throat> We've obviously had a long and very productive uh, collaboration. And I think there are probably two reasons for that. One, we've always been friends as well as colleagues. And two, we have really complementary talents. For example, Bob's the smart one, I'm the cute one. <laughs> um, Bob works really hard, and I'm kind of a lazy slug. Bob writes really well, and I'm trying to, still trying to figure out the difference between nouns and verbs. <laughs> so if any of you students or new professionals out there, if any of you would, might like to stand up here someday, I got a tip for you. Find a colleague who's smarter than you, works harder than you, and writes better than you. Okay. That said, don't hold Bob responsible for anything I'm going to say today, especially if you don't like it. 
Rather, when you've been in the field, as long as I have, there will be a number of people whose writings have informed, educated, and inspired you. They've written articles that you wish you had written, and much that I have to say today has already been more eloquently discussed by Leland Wilkinson in the APA Task Force on Statistical Inference, Doug Moak, Frank Schmidt, Bob Rosenthal, and my personal professional hero, the late Jacob Cohen. In fact, Cohen had a pithy little quote that's going to provide the context for the first part of my talk, and that is, less is more. There's another quote that I love, not as pithy, but it gets the point across. The enormous variety of quantitative methods leaves researchers with the non-trivial task of matching analysis and design to research questions. Although complex designs and state-of-the-art methods are sometimes necessary to address questions uh, effectively, simpler classical approaches often can provide elegant and sufficient answers to important questions. Don't choose an analytic method to impress your readers or to deflect criticism. If the assumptions and strengths of a simpler method are reasonable for your data and research problem, use it. Occam's razor applies as much to methods as well as theories. If you know where that comes from, I've already mentioned the source. It's from the Wilkinson Task Force uh, report on statistical inference that was published in the American Psychologist in 1999. It's an article that I have all my students read. Uh, they probably get tired of reading it because I assign it in every class. Doesn't matter the kind. Group counseling, read Wilkinson. <laughs> I don't teach group counseling, but they would read Wilkinson <laughs> if I did. Uh, it, all, it also illustrates the main points, one of the main points I want to make today, namely that simple is often better, or less is more, that minimally sufficient designs have had a major impact on science as well as practice and policy, and that questions should dictate our methods rather than vice versa. However, in addition to asking all my students to read the Wilkinson Task Force Report and highlighting the above, above quote, I also warned them to follow the principle of minimally sufficient designs at their own risk, or at least until they get tenure. Uh, Christopher Peterson related a wonderful story that illustrates my point. It seems that Peterson once did a very simple study showing that variable B mediated the relationship between variables A and C. That is, the correlation between A and C reduced to near zero when B, B was partialed out. However, journal reviewers weren't at all happy and suggested very strongly that if he wanted to get the study published, he needed to use structural equation modeling. Well, he decided to do just that. Uh, and, and he decided to do that after buying necessary software, consulting uh, with statistical experts, and spending another year on the study. And he found exactly what he found with the simple partial correlation, that the relationship between A and C was mediated by, by variable B. Although I'm sure some of you feel that Peterson and me for bringing up the story are statistical luddites who need to get with the program. My point is that the assumptions involved in more complex analyses are more extensive than in simpler analyses, and that simpler analyses might be the most direct uh, and reasonable way to address your research question. Let me give you, let me give you some illustrations that I think show that some of the most important in scientifically and practically impactful studies in the history of psychology were amazingly simple. How about Bandura's elegant, if you haven't read the original 1977 self-efficacy period piece, you have to. How about Bandura, Bandura's elegant laboratory studies using snake 
anxious college students when he introduced self-efficacy theory in 1977? Or how about Nancy Betts and Gail Hackett's straightforward empirical demonstration of the importance of self-efficacy beliefs in explaining women's career choices? The impact that these two studies has had across multiple disciplines is really mind-boggling. What about Harry Harlow's monkey studies that destroyed drive reduction theories of infant attachment and opened up new ways of looking at infant attachment? Those of you, of you who are interested in infant attachment should read and bless this study because it's why you're here. What about John Holland's quite simple but elegant study of the structure of interest, which by the way, I think still does a decent job of representing the structure of interest, at least among people in the Western world. And that would be especially true if you turn this circle into a globe by adding a prestige dimension a la Terry Tracy. I could go on and on, but let me end this part with, uh, with what I think is the most important study in the history of psychology, and that's the Clark study of rac racial attitudes of African American children. It, after all, influenced the Supreme Court to rule that separate but equal education was an oxymoron, and that the schools needed to be integrated. One commonality among these studies is that they're somewhat old. They were published before we got so sophisticated. Would these be published today? That's unanswerable, and it's only a question that a young or old curmudgeon like me would ask. Grump, grump. Um, <laughs> but I think they do illustrate the point I want to make today, that more is not always better, that we should not be using complex statistical software just because we can. The above studies were not important because they had complex designs and used complex statistical analyses with a thousand or so bootstraps. Rather, they were important because they asked straightforward questions and were simple in design and analyses. I want to be clear that I am no way suggesting that more complex designs and analytic strategies do not have their place, but simply that we think before launching off on complex studies to assure that the questions we are asking are very clear and straightforward and our designs and analyses are minimally sufficient to address our questions. At the risk of being too self-congratulatory, I think Bob, Yale, and I developed a theory that's had a somewhat large impact on vocational educational psychology research and practice and even policies policy many of you might have even been chuckling to yourselves as i was going on about my simplicity diatribe because you remembered all the arrows <laughs> in that in the original scc team model However, I hope that you also remembered that each arrow had clearly stated hypotheses behind it. Each, of the arrow also, each arrow also had some empirical support for it. It turns out that some of the hypotheses were wrong, like the hypothesized direct uh, effect of supports and barriers on choices. But I think the test of the theory were facilitated because of the clearly stated hypotheses rather than being only arrows in our model. I also think that the prior thinking that went into developing the hypotheses had much to do, have much to do with their empirical robustness of SCC and T in general. I do, however, have a warning for those of you who want to assure that your arrows are well thought out. You might have to spend time needlessly arguing with editors who want you to willy-nilly add more arrows to your model. You know, you know, I also used to have great faith in meta-analyses as being able to bring order and direction to our literatures, and I think they used to be able to do that and more until meta-analysis also got so sophisticated. 
I'm going to start out by talking about two meta-analytic studies that I really like, and then I'm going to finish up talking about why I like them and how they're different from kind of the present state of affairs. Again, at the risk of being too self-congratulatory, let me use the Brown and Ryan Crane meta-analysis as the first example. My interest in doing this meta-analysis grew out of teaching a graduate level course on uh, career development and counseling. In this course, I could very easily talk about theory and how each theory individually and all theories collectively could be used in working with clients. But beyond that, I really couldn't say much about how effective career counseling was for specific client concerns, or whether the ingredients suggested by writings on the theory and practice really contributed to outcome. There had been prior meta-analyses addressing uh, questions of career counseling effectiveness, but the outcome studied in these meta-analyses seemed to be so dif diffuse that I, I had a hard time drawing counseling implications from them. Thus, Nancy and I first decided to target our meta-analysis to outcomes associated with choice making and to ask how effective is counseling for persons with choice making difficulties, rather than the plethora of other reasons why a person might seek career counseling. Then we asked whether ingredients suggested in the clinical and theoretical literatures had an effect on outcome beyond study, research method, type of treatment, or client characteristics. There were also multiple outcomes in the studies included or meta-analysis that could be related to choice-making difficulties like career maturity, dysfunctional career thinking, vocational identity, level of decidedness, to name a few. However, most of these, these outcomes were studied with insufficient frequency to do a meta-analysis of each outcome. We also really weren't interested in all these different outcomes anyway. Scores on many of these measures also were so highly interrelated that I think they're actually measuring the same thing, a topic I'll address in a few minutes. Rather, the questions that drove our meta-analysis in the, uh, in the first place were two. How effective are career interventions for choice making difficulties, not for improving career maturity or vocational identity or other things? And do any ingredients account for an additional unique variance in counseling outcome over and above the factors I have already mentioned? We found that we could address these two questions with a sufficient number of samples to yield stable effect size estimates. Samples were 62 with 7,720 participants. Thus, we collapsed over outcome and found a weighted average overall effect size of 0.34 in that via a simple weighted least squares regression found that five coded ingredients added unique variance in overall effect size. We reported these results along with a couple of simple graphs that looked at the relationship between number of ingredients in effect size and number of sessions in effect size and quit. Simply put, we started out with two very straightforward research questions, meta-analyzed data to address these two questions, re re refrain from engaging in meta-silliness, I'll explain that soon, and quit. There's another meta-analysis in our literature that I'd like to highlight as, as a model way to do meta-analysis. This was a meta-analysis published in JCP in 2011 by Rakal Cabral, uh, Cabral and Timothy Smith on client counselor and ethnic matching. First, Cabral and Smith set out to address three very specific research questions via the meta-analysis. Is client counselor matching on race ethnicity related to A, client preferences, B, client perceptions of the counselor like credibility and expertness, and client outcome. Second, they also had four well-developed potential moderator variables that they wanted to explore. Clients age, gender, age, 
race, clients' race, gender, age, and education. Third, they addressed each question meta-analytically and only tested for their a priori hypothesized moderators. Fourth, they only had two tables that were easy to follow and highly informative. And fifth, they did it in 10 pages. <laughs> Why am I highlighting these two studies? Simply put, I think there's a lot of meta-silliness going on that meta-analysis have gotten way too complex. Mining data for every possible relation and every possible moderator, in part, I think, because we now have the statistical software to run the analyses in nanoseconds. For example, a doctoral student in our research methods program, Joshua Polanin, did his dissertation testing various methods to control for type 1 error rates in meta-analyses. In order to make a case for a study, Josh surveyed randomly selected issues of two major journals that tend to be major publication outlets for meta-analyses, Psych Bulletin and the Review of Educational Research, to see how many significance tests tended to be run. Here's what he, here's what he found, and I didn't misplace a decimal. The average number of significance tests run in meta-analysis was 70.82, with a standard deviation of 94.20. To be fair, the median was about 45, still pretty large. But can you imagine how many statistical significance tests had to be run in some of the meta-analysis? To, for, to get a standard deviation of 94.20 and drive the mean up that high? Isn't this meta-silliness? There must have been something, some important findings in these meta-analysis, but trying to find them may be akin to finding Waldo. <laughs> I think we've gotten way too sophisticated for our own good. And the Cohen, Cohen and Wilkinson quotes really need to be taken into heart by any of you planning to do a meta-analysis. I think another reason for the meta-silliness is that meta-analyses are often thought of as quantitative literature review procedures rather than as legitimate research strategies in their own right. In general, there are three ways one could address a research question via a primary analysis, a secondary analysis, or a meta-analysis. Say you were interested, like Raquel and Timothy, in whether client, counselor, ethnic match is related to outcome. You could approach this question with a primary, meta -ana primary analysis strategy by, by analyzing already published data. Uh, by, by collecting your own data, which, but I hope you wouldn't until after you read Raquel and Timothy's meta-analysis. Uh, you could use a secondary analytic strategy by reanalyzing already published data, or you could use a meta-analytic strategy by combining results over a number of studies or samples. The point I want to make here is that if meta-analysis is considered to be a research strategy rather than simply as a way to do literature reviews, then everything I said previously holds for meta-analysis as well. That is, in doing a meta-analysis, you should think clearly about the question or questions that you want to address, collect data to address these questions, use the simplest meta-analytic strategy that adequately addresses your questions, present the data that addresses these questions, note limitations, draw implications and conclusions, and quit. We don't have to mine meta-analytic data to address every possible question that could be addressed or to analyze for every possible moderator, no matter how nonsensically sensical it is, run tons of significance tests, present multiple unreadable tables, and wow our readers with their statistical sophistication. So, my take-home message so far is that less really can be more. I also believe, though, in addition to less is more, fewer can also be better. 
this is my noun verb. Is, should that be fewer are better or fewer is better? <laughs> anyway, that's what we're going to say. Fewer, I think fewer can, can also be better, especially when it comes to the con constructs with, that we study. I'm not sure who to blame this state of affairs on, but we have way too many constructs in our literature that may be or actually are empirically redundant. Scores on measures of these constructs co-vary so much that they're actually measuring the same thing. Frank Schmidt has shown pretty convincingly how construct proliferation or redundancy is a major problem in I.O. research, and I assert it is a problem in our literature as well. As Schmidt indicated, construct proliferation is a problem because it flies in the face of the principle of parsimony that should guide scientific research. It also, more importantly to me, hinders our ability to achieve cumulative knowledge because separate literatures frequently grow up around these supposedly different but empirically redundant constructs, never to be clearly integrated into a single cogent nomological network. How can we tell if two constructs are redundant? First, we have to realize that the obtained correlations between measures of constructs are always attenuated, lower than they should be, or lower than the correlations between the constructs themselves. This is because measures are never perfect. You all know that, right? All my students are. <laughs> measures are never, measures are never perfect. Um, scores obtained on them are influenced by sampling error, score unreliability, the nature, nature of the sample from which data were obtained and more. However, when we correct the obtained correlations for as many sources of artifact as possible, the resulting disattenuated correlation is a good estimate of the relationship between the constructs rather than the relationship between fallible measures of them. If the, re if the resulting disattenuated correlation is close to unity, then the two measures are actually measuring the same construct. The constructs are redundant. Let me provide a couple of examples from our literatures, or at least one of our literatures, vocational psychology, because that's the one I know, that illustrate construct redundancy. I didn't, I didn't choose these examples to pick on anyone or to make examples of anyone. I simply chose them because the data were easy to access. My first one involves two constructs uh, that have been widely studied in the vocational uh, psychology literature, decision-making confusion and vocational identity. And I've got a couple sample items. One set of items is intended to measure this decision-making confusion, while the other set was developed vocational identity or lack thereof. Just looking at the example items might begin to get, make you a bit suspicious. How can items that look so similar in content be measuring two different things? I was able to find internal consistency as ancestry test reliability estimates for scores on these two scales in similar, similar samples of college students. The manual for the decision-making confusion me me measure also reported a correlation between the scores on two, these two measures, decision-making confusion, vocational identity, and college students of minus 0.69. Correcting this correlation for both content sampling error and time of measurement error using standard disattenuation formula yielded a corrected correlation of minus, should, of minus, point nine, uh, point eight, not nine, minus point 0.91, close enough to unity, given I was not able to correct for other potential artifacts, to suggest that these two measures may actually be measuring the same construct whether it's called vocational identity or the lack thereof, or decision-making confusion or something else, these are highly redundant constructs and their literatures really could be merged into a single nomological network to better advance knowledge and inform practice. 
My second example comes from one of my current research interests, how to promote positive future work expectations in youth. We initially called this construct vocational hope or a positive motivational state associated with envisioning a future in which meaningful work is attainable. But as we tried to operationalize it, it and measure it, we quickly discovered a number of other constructs in the literature that tapped into similar positive future expectation, each with its own measure. These include work volition, work hope, hope, I forgot to put it up there, career optimism, career concern, future time perspective. Further, each measure included remarkably similar items and remarkably similar to the items that we were trying to write to measure vocational hope, except for C.R. Snyder's hope scale, which didn't seem to us to be measuring anything about the future at all. In order, so in order to further avoid con, to avoid further construct proliferation, we decided to collect data on each of these in, instruments by administering them or subsets of items from them to two samples of uh, young people, one in the U.S. and one in Italy. And I don't know if they're out there, but thanks, Salvatore, uh, Laura, and Leah. Uh, we weren't able to get test retest estimates, but we could calculate internal consistency estimates from the Italians. I mean, maybe back up. The kids in the U.S. couldn't do positive and negatively worded items. When we factor analyze the U.S. data, there was a positively worded factor and a negatively worded factor. So the data I'm going to present to you here comes from Italy. Come from Italy. <laughs> Um, so, um, we were able to calculate internal consistency estimates, um, and we accredited for content sampling error only via the internal consistency estimates, and they yielded the file following pattern of correlations. Um, although these suggested to us that work volition and work hope those scales might be re measuring redundant constructs, as well as career concerns and future time perspectives. Perspective. There was some sufficient discrimination to suggest that all of these constructs may not be redundant. Thus, we next factor analyzed the inner item correlation matrix via principal axis factoring with a bleak rotation. And the solution converged on a very interpretable three-factor solution. Here's the first, some example items on the first factor. As expected, all work hope, all work volition, work hope, and Snyder's pathway items, which we also included, loaded on the first factor, along with some items on the career optimism scale. The common denominator, I think, among these items is a sense of confidence. Confidence in finding work, confidence in setting goals, confidence in changing jobs, etc. Thus, we think that work hope, career volition, or work volition, and Snyder's, path, Snyder's pathways are really redundant constructs. They're all measuring the same thing. And from my unbiased eyes, those look a lot like self-management, self-efficacy beliefs, don't they? Other items on the career optimism scale loaded on the second factor along with all career concerns and future time perspective items. What seems to differentiate these items from the items on the first fa factor is a lack of reference to, con uh, to confidence. They simply seem to reflect a positive or negative outlook uh, about the future. Or maybe, once again, through my SCCT lens, self-management outcome expectations. What I'm suggesting here is that the, that the constructs of work volition, work hope, career optimism, career concerns, and future time perspectives could be reduced to two central constructs and put in a single nomological network. And if you buy that these may represent self-management, self-efficacy beliefs and outcome expectations, do I have a nomological network for you?
Oops, sorry. Uh, do I have a nomological network <laughs> for you? You can read it there, 2013. Parenthetically, this third factor contained all of C.R. Snyder's agency items, along with items from measures of dispositional optimism and mastery beliefs. We included uh, the latter items, uh, or the items from the latter measure, to see how saturated scores on all the other measures were with general feelings of optimism and mastery. Our tentative answer is that C.R. Snyder's agency scale is so saturated, uh, is so saturated by mastery beliefs and career optimism that the agency scale might be just another way to assess people's mastery beliefs, not hope. These are but two illustrations of the problem of construct, proliferation, and redundancy in our field. This is a topic to me that deserves future attention in the future if we are going to be able to achieve cumulative knowledge in our field and develop into a counseling psychology science. At the very least, investigators need to demonstrate before introducing new constructs that their constructs are not just conceptually unique, but empirically unique as well. That they add something new to our science and practice. Well, there are some things that I would, I would have loved to talk about, but I've run out of time. One that I hit upon in my discussion of construct redundancy is the importance of not only reporting and reliability estimates, but also being aware of their effects on obtained results. Another is the widespread increase in type 2 errors that I've noticed in our literature is associated with the unthinking use of Bonferroni corrections in omnibus as opposed to focused significance tests. I actually get to talk about that one on Saturday if anybody wants to come. And still another to me is the very short-sighted views that we have on external validity in the clinical relevance of research. Think Harry Harlow's monkeys, if you will. But these, they weren't even representative of monkeys. But, but these and some others will have to wait until another day. So thanks, and I was taught early in my career Thanks, Bob. To always leave your audience with a take home message. So here's mine. <laughs> Less really can be more, and fewer really can be better, except when it comes to thinking and sample size. And thank you. Got, yeah, just a few minutes for questions, if, if anybody has any. Yes? Yeah. What would Paul Could Neal you? think of your comments? He would love them. I, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us why. Paul, Paul, because, whoops. He would love them because I think, especially the construct redundancy issue, um, he was very much Besides being a philosopher, very much an empiricist, I think he would love it. Um, and yeah, I think I, I, I'm trying to come up with Paul Meal stories from Minnesota, but Nadja said don't do it, so. <laughs> <laughs> you equate that, I, I'm so pleased. You equated, you kind of thought what I was saying was Paul Mealish. Wow. <laughs> He was also one of my heroes. Okay, thank you all. <laughs>